but let's slow it. Let's get down to 200 knots and see what happens. The crisis is worse than ever. Uncertain how the plane will react if they try to slow it down, the pilots must still pull on the elevators to maintain level flight. Captain Thompson once again tries to get help from maintenance. Maintenance, 261, are you on? Yeah, 261, this is maintenance. Okay, we did both the pickle switch and the suitcase handles, and it ran, ran away, it ran away full nose trimmed down. Oh, it ran away trimmed down? Okay, and now we're in a damn pinch, and we're holding, we're worse than we were before. You're getting full nose trimmed down, but you don't get no nose trim up. Is that correct? That's a firm. We went to full nose down, and I'm afraid to try it again to see if it would go in the other direction. Okay, well, your discretion. Uh, if you want to try it, that's okay with me. If not, that's fine. See you at the game. As important as it is to have that ground contact with, uh, with people with maintenance manuals and experience on the ground and the ability to call up the manufacturer, it's not always going to give you a magic answer. The crew had already gone through every logic tree they possibly could think of. Maintenance clearly does not appreciate the significance of the situation, and this is the last the crew will hear from them. No one can help the pilots now as they struggle with the plane's jammed stabilizer. Ever professional, however, they try to put the passengers at ease. Folks, that we have had a flight control problem up front here. We're working it. Uh, that's Los Angeles off to the right there, and that's where we're intended to go. We're pretty busy up here working this situation. I don't anticipate any big problems once we get a couple of subsystems on the line. But we will be going into LAX, and I anticipate us parking there in about 20 to 30 minutes. In fact, they will never make it to Los Angeles. But that is just the beginning of a real-life horror story yet to unfold. After the terrifying 8,000 feet plunge downwards, Alaska Airlines 261 has now leveled out. LA, Alaska 261, we're with you. We're at 22.5. We have a jam stabilizer, and we're maintaining altitude with difficulty. But uh, we can maintain altitude, we think. And our intention is to land at Los Angeles. The pilots request to be routed out over the Pacific Ocean, away from the airport. Center, uh, Alaska 261. I, I need to get down about 10, change my configurations to make sure I can control the jet. And I'd like to do that over the bay here, if I may. If the worst happens, the pilots don't want to kill people on the ground as well as in the plane. There are a lot of lives saved that people maybe don't realize by the fact that this air crew said, let's stay out over the water until we've got this thing completely under control. As they maneuver over the ocean, the crew again ask air traffic control to keep the space around the plane clear. Alaska 261, fly a heading of 280 and descend and maintain 17,000. 280 and 17, 17,000, Alaska 261, and we're generally needing a block altitude. Alaska 261, Roger. I need everything picked up and everybody strapped down. The pilots concentrate on trying to fix the plane, even though they don't know what will happen. Test flying now. How's it feel? It's wanting to pitch over more. OK, get some power on. Uh, I'm at 250 knots. Real hard? Well, actually, it's pretty stable right here, see? But we got to get it down to 180. The pilots try to slow the aircraft down to landing speed without losing control. But as they inch their way toward a solution, every move they make could have fatal consequences. The only hope for the passengers is that the pilot's skill and experience can get the plane to Los Angeles Airport. It's on the stop now, it's on the stop. Not according to this, it's not. As one effort after another fails, the crew wonder if the stabilizer is damaged. The trim might be 
And then it might be if uh, something's popped back there. Yeah. It might be mechanical damage, too. I think if it's controllable, we ought to just try and land it. Think so? Okay, let's head for LA. But just as they prepare to land in Los Angeles, something gives way in the tail of the plane. Did you feel that? Yep. Okay, give me slats. This is a bitch. Is it? Yep. The plane dives straight down from 18,000 feet. <laughs> Avoid collisions. Los Angeles Control has warned the pilots of nearby planes that Alaska 261 is in difficulty. These pilots now report back to the tower. That plane has just started to do a big, huge plunge. Yep. Yes, sir. He is uh, definitely in a nose down position descending quite rapidly. Definitely out of control. The pilots have difficulty reaching the controls. The plane is upside down, but they believe they might be able to roll the plane out of the dive. Mayday! Push and roll! Push and roll! Kick damn it! Push! 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 Push the blue side up! They tried to fly the airplane even upside down. They never for a moment believed that they could not find a way to control this airplane. Push, I'm pushing. Okay, let's kick rudder. Left rudder, left rudder. Can't reach it. Okay, right rudder, right rudder. Ah. Plane was being knocked from side to side. It turned upside down. It was spinning. Persons were being thrown against the walls of the plane, falling out of their seats, and the cockpit voice recorder screaming. Um, un unbelievable, uh, horrible last few minutes of their lives. Are we flying? We're flying. We're flying. Tell them what we're doing. Let me just. Ah, damn. At least upside down, we're flying. Yeah. And it was so violently upside down that the pilots were hanging from their shoulder straps. Passengers don't have shoulder straps. Terrifying 60 second dive. Flight 261 hit the Pacific Ocean at close to 250 miles an hour. Rescue helicopters were soon at the crash site, but there were no survivors. The plane had broken up on impact. 88 passengers and crew, including three young children, died instantly. Fred Miller lost his daughter, Abby, and her husband, Ryan. These people suffered on the way down. This was not a pretty way to die. One witness said it spun at times, almost like a top. And he said, to think people, somebody who has a life to li live, is in there, dying. He said, he, said, he said, it's one of the most horrifying memories I'll ever have. Susan De Silva lost her husband, Dean. I know that they went through a horrible, horrible experience. It, this was a violent end these people suffered. There were no bodies that were in, intact or even close to intact. And they were conscious for a long time before it all came apart. 
Pauline Worley died along with her fiance, Monty. As a mother, keep waiting for your, for your child to come home. And Colleen had traveled so much in her, in her life that it was, it was unusual not to have her just walk in the door. All this time, you, you're thinking, something caused this, something made this happen, and I want to find out who's responsible for this. The investigation into Alaska Airlines Flight 261 began to swing into gear, but the wreckage lay 700 feet down. So National Transportation Safety Board officials called on Navy submersibles to retrieve the plane from the seabed. We set up a base of operations and we had a remote operating vehicle with the side scanning sonar which they used to map the debris field and get an idea of how widely spread the wreckage was. At the National Transportation Safety Board headquarters in Washington, the investigators' immediate concern was to find out what had brought the plane down. The first clues came from the cockpit voice recordings. LA, Alaska 261, we're with you. We're at 22.5, we have a jam stabilizer, and we're maintaining altitude with difficulty. We immediately suspected some problem in the tail of the airplane which is where the controls are. There's something was wrong back there, and that was the key piece of wreckage to look for. The MD-83 that crashed was a revised version of the Douglas Corporation's DC-9, which was an extremely popular plane. Over 2,000 were delivered to airlines worldwide. The engines were at the rear of the plane, and the distinctive T-shaped tail was an essential element of the design. In a big turbojet aircraft, one of the rather brilliant elements of the design is that since you're going to be loading passengers and cargo, you want to be able to have that aircraft loaded a little nose heavy or a little tail heavy. Well, in order to do that, you had to actually had to have that entire stabilizer moving. But the ones that are the most difficult to engineer are the T-tailed airplanes, where you have the vertical stabilizer and the horizontal sitting on top. And we call that stabilizer trim. And that is an essential element of what makes these aircraft so usable. In the MD-83, a motorized jack screw in the tail moves the horizontal stabilizer up and down. As the stabilizer moves up, the nose of the airplane moves down. As the stabilizer moves down, the nose of the airplane moves up. But what role had the over 70 centimeters long jack screw played in the loss of Flight 261? The investigators were anxious to inspect it as soon as it was recovered from the seabed. The jack screw wasn't mated with the nut that it screws into. It was just by itself. And the nut was found in another piece of structure a few feet away from where the jack screw was. To have a screw separate itself from a, from a nut with very thick threads surprised us. Secondly, we noticed that there was a curled piece of brass around the jack screw. And all of the threads that you can see here, these ridges, were gone. They had been stripped out. And the remnants of those were found coiled on the jack screw. Once the thread had been stripped off the nut, the jack screw could no longer turn. The pilots could not have known the real nature of the problem. 